so next up we have uh, Mr. Martin Ward and Nicole Altman. Uh, so please join us. Uh, come on up, guys. Uh, Martin and Nicole are going to talk to us about remodelling of the nurse navigator role in the ED, changing corporate high heels and fancy dress into clinical scrubs in one foul sweep. What a great title. Um, uh, Martin is a clinical nurse consultant in the emergency department at Raw North Shore, and no stranger uh, to many of us, I'm sure. He's qualified to the Wazoo. He's got uh, his UK uh, registered psychiatric nurse um, certificate. He's, well, he's also got his grad dip in uh, uh, public sector management, as well as a master of management at UTS. He is an associate fellow at the UTS um, and also a fellow of the New South Wales College of Nursing. And uh, Nicole, is uh, she's an ICU nurse back in uh, uh, Germany as well as in Australia for a long time, 22 years, and half of that she spent in ED. Uh, since the last two years she's been working in the nurse navigator role and more recently she's joined uh, the, the trauma team as the case manager uh, uh, role at Raw North Shore Hospital. And casually she's also a lecturer for the University of Technology, Sydney. So I'd like to you all to give a nice warm welcome to Nicole and uh, Martin. Thank you, Matt, for your introductory words and the invitation for Martin and myself to present our experience here today with the remodeling of the nurse navigator role in the emergency department. We changed co um, corporate um, high heels and fancy dresses into clinical scrubs with one full swoop. So Royal North Shore Hospital is a leading tertiary hospital in New South Wales, just here north of the Harbour Bridge and a level one trauma centre. During the last year, over 72,000 patients presented to the emergency department with daily presentations ranging from 250 to 330 patients. So you can see there on the photo, this is a very rare situation like Utopia and abandoned ED. This was our new emergency department prior to its opening in 2012, with no signs of overcrowding or access block or other daily battles. It is well known that patients' prolonged length of stay in the emergency department is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, patient dissatisfaction, and a public concern for the um, overall quality and functioning of the healthcare system. In, so in 2005, England became a pioneer in addressing this global dilemma by arbitrarily setting a standard for limiting length of the patient's length of stay in the emergency department to a maximum of four hours. Due to increasingly facing criticism, performance trajectories were then implemented in 2017. In Australia, the four-hour rule was then um, firstly implemented in Western Australia in 2009, and due to increasingly pressure in the emergency department nationwide, with the aim that by 2015, 90% of patients will depart the ED within four hours, which was then referred to as the National Emergency Access Target Need. This concept was replaced in 2015 by the emergency treatment um, performance, which said that the length of stay would be at 81%, which is not a Commonwealth target. However, New South Wales still uses it, and other um, states as well, as a drive of change for change, which leads us now um, to the opportunities of NEED or ETP. NEED has been a means to initiate innovative operational changes to improve throughput of patients in the emergency department. This clinical redesign has been driven by whole of hospital approach with executive engagement and leadership. Clinical restructuring, and not only NEED or ETP on its own, has retrospectively shown, sorry, has retrospectively shown um, 
a reduction in um, ED crowding in hospital uh, mortality and improved patient flow. Despite the fact that Australia has emphasized that EDP will not overrule clinical judgment, the focus on need has led to distortion of priorities in emergency care, which has been a significant threat to patient safety to avoid breaches. Suboptimal patient management due to time pressure on staff, lack of senior clinical supervision led to poor patient moral. Data manipulation and the relabeling of short stay wards has, um, as patient destinations are well documented. So the navigator concept has been developed in cancer care and was adopted to the emergency department setting in 2012 to facilitate the patient journey in the emergency department in a timely manner with non-clinical in interventions to achieve need. At Royal North Shore Hospital, that um, nurse navigator role was introduced in November 2013. However, our ED had insufficient time to review and analyze how this navigator model suited our care delivery and our model of care. So the nature of this non-clinical model in conjunction with time-based um, targets caused a lot of dissatisfaction of staff in this role. Since they were suddenly telling their peers what to do who were already under immense time pressure. Fellow health professionals, so nurses and doctors, increasingly resented information and questions from the navigator, causing communication problems, disharmony across the ED, and a lot of frustration. To sum up, the outcome of the nurse imple navigator implementation sh um, showed that no appreciable benefits were identified. So to develop the, re -navigator the navigator role, the navigator working party decided then to visit EDs of, non of two non-tertiary hospitals who had a nurse navigator for the last 12 months. EDs were similar in their patient presentations but had different models of care. The navigator in hospital A concentrated on incoming patients in the department and their allocation. In contrast, the navigator of hospital B concentrated on the patient flow out of the um, department. It was also noted that the inpatient wards of both hospitals actively pulled patients out of the ED when the beds were ready. Pending investigations and care was followed up also on the wards. Since both navigator models remain strictly non-clinical, consequently bedside nurses were still left alone in carrying out these instructions. And both hospitals in general focused more on patients to be admitted rather than to be um, discharged. So we questioned whether the non-clinical approach was effected, effective and efficient for our patient journey. So in 2011 already, in a review of the four-hour rule on issues of Western Australia, had already been documented intimidation and stress creation in the context of a non-clinical um, navigator role to which we already could relate to. So how can we um, how can good care be achieved then with a time-based target? And then the redesign commenced. Isn't it wonderful, Germany meeting Australia at a conference which is international. Thank you, Furloin. Okay. So we introduced our navigator, role, which we considered clinical was the way to go, and we were determined this was the way to go, of course. So we looked at basic motivation, and as you know, there's the stick, and there's the little donkey in the middle, and then there's the carrot, and that's the way motivation normally works. 
So we looked at the stick approach, and there's whips here and everything, and we had a long, hard look at these people here, and we thought, they're quite alluring, and we were tempted, but I said, no, resist. These people can't keep it up all day long, and even if they can keep it up all day long, the staff can't keep up with them. It will end in tears. So we consulted the staff. Now, at the same time we're consulting with the staff, I turned around and I said, where are all the staff specialists? Well, they'd buggered off on some junket to Western Australia to a place called Perth. When they returned the following Monday, they announced their findings. They said that senior clinical review um, ended up with better patient care or words to that effect, you see. So in other words, the more senior the doctor, the, uh, the quicker the decision was to admit the patient or to do some testing. So anyway, that was on the Wednesday. Monday, we all got to work, you see. So boom, the accelerator was put straight on there. Bang, 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 bang. And all the nurses fell over sideways crying because there was too much work to do. This then determined us as the manufacturers of this um, model that we needed to be clinical to support the nurses because the doctors changed their model of care. The facts then were exposed. Less experienced staff take longer to complete clinical interventions. And they, we also felt still that whipping clinical staff is counterproductive and it's very unenlightened. So we were introducing the navigator. We were determined still to focus on the clinical nursing interventions. And then we were starting to feel we can only influence what's in our direct control. Bing, moment of epiphany, ding, 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 ocean thinking, crest of the wave. We thought, what can we do about this? Let's concentrate on what we can actually control. Yippee, it's the same in German, yippee non-admitted ETP. So we met with the administrators of the hospital and we said, we've got a deal for you. We can prove we're effective and efficient and we can actually discharge patients within four hours safely and we can achieve a good ETP of the discharged patients. However, we'll try to help you with the, the problem of the um, inpatient beds, but that really is your problem and it's your pay scale that pays for you to deal with that problem. We'll help you, but we'll deal with our own problem. That was the for the moment of our model of care. So then they said, where's the evidence? Ooh, quality of surveys were rushed around and off we went. We discovered there was an immediate improvement of care. There was a huge reduction in the amount of IMS and effective communication between medical and nursing navigators was together, there was no hatred and there was love brewing. Uh, there was recognition by the medical teams that the people in this position were well respected and they did a good um, job in our department. So at the base of this pyramid, we see there's a cohesive approach to patient care. We went on. The contributes to a positive educational environment. We believe that if the, um, the navigator's in there and there's no educator and you're going to do something, oh, let me help you put that nasogastric tube in so next time when you do it, you feel more confident and that's the education. Ding, we were nourishing the patient journey and educating the nurses at the same time and they felt really glowing about this. There was a good communication improvement and then the whispering in the tea room would occur. Isn't it wonderful the way they carry on with these navigators, we're not bullied by them and all this. So satisfaction was brewing and there was a positive working environment which we all enjoyed going to work. So we're really on the move with our navigator role. So basically, the model works for us because it's a permanent senior nursing member of staff who is respected by the nursing colleagues and by doctors alike. It's important that you've got street credibility to be in the position and not just a bully boss. Um, it also, from a management perspective, from my perspective, once you've got the senior good person on the shift, the skill mix is not so diluted down and it's quite a safer environment for the patients to be in for those brief four hours they're there. Um, clinical governance, the safety checkout was paramount. It's, it used to be tick, 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 get them upstairs and then the IMSID would come flying back and the patient would come flying back in the lift. This wasn't done, etc. So there's governance over safe checkout and we are a winner with that one. 
The weekly navigator reports assist in identification of impediments to patient flow. So the reports weekly say the usual culprits are the problem of getting patients onto the ward. And we discovered they are radiology, the bed's not ready. If the bed is ready, the nurse can't take the hand over. If they can take the hand over, the wrong sex of the patient's going in a mixed ward and they have to shovel around. So all those delays are reported back to the administrator to say, you need to fix this problem, we can't fix it for you. Uh, so that was a, a bonus to us. So what we did achieve together was clinical leadership and clinical engagement of all staff together. We had faster departures from the bed ready to ED, steady improvement in departure of discharged patients from ED. There was an increased utilization of the EMU, which was good because those patients will be discharged earlier than going upstairs. And I think above all, there was a cultural change which we had implemented where everyone was part of ETP, including the cleaners, the clerks, and the candlestick makers. And I would daily meet with the other staff and say, you know what we're doing today, we're going to reach our target. So we were all together and it was quite a good experience. Uh, Multifactual challenges are being addressed by the administrators as I speak now. So we believe we've done a good job and so does the hospital. So thank you and thank you for listening. Any questions? Come and see schnell. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. That was fantastic. Uh, come up here, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, questions from the audience? Oh, yes, oh. yes, yes. <laughs> um, we have a navigator in our department, and um, we have the navigator, we have the team leader, and we have the clinical num. Do you find that their roles were clashing at times, and it was hard for the navigator to do the job when the nums already doing that job and the team leader's already doing that job? Not, no, not so ever. The NUM has a role. The NUM actually gets the patients in the bed and they do the first two hours of the journey, really. The navigator comes in and speaks to the NUM and says, what can I do to help you with the patients in there? So they work together from the beginning. Then the navigator sorts out with the nurses to get the patients out. So the NUM has a function and it's um, su well, supplemented and um, adhered to by the Navigators, do you want to say if that's correct? Yeah. And do you have a team leader so, so as well? So it works well. well do so you when you design the, um, the model, you've got to make it quite pure to who does what rather than crossing over. When we went to hospitals A and B, that's not me ringing, is it? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it means I'm speaking at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll shut up now. What's the next question? <laughs> oh, no, I just wanted to know if you had a team leader in addition to the navigator and the number. Yes, we do. We have two team leaders, but we don't call them team leaders because administrators see team leaders as supernumerary. They nick them, you see, and they cause more problems. So we call them clinical resource nurses. So everything nourishes resources clinically, you see. So, yes, they're really team leaders. And then the navigator goes to each team leader, what could I do for you, how are you going? So it's really supportive as a role. Hmm. Thank you. Hello, uh, we've just started doing navigator nursing in our emergency department in South Australia and the doctors hate us. How did you... No, they love us. <laughs> <laughs> How did you uh, get the doctors on side? We, we sat down as a team and said, listen, this is coming down from above. We've got to do something about it. But our doctors were actually on side because they'd seen the same research we were talking about, that it's better for the patient care to get them out. And it's, um, they're actually um, on, on board very much these days. They, they love getting on the shift. And the staff specialists will sort of have competitions to say, we, we got neat. We, we blitzed it, you see. So they see it as quite fun now and a challenge. That seems very strange, doesn't it? But you've got to sit down. You just can't throw something into a system and say, we'll show you how to do it, because you've got to get them on side. If they're offside, they'll always be offside. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, I just want to add uh, some information to your question. What we also did was that um, I provided also in-services on the registrar teaching um, day to um, identify also if there were any um, barriers um, to identify them and to communicate them so that we were um, getting onto the same um, 
that we got some agreement, and also what I did when I was there when we implemented it and put that also with into practice, that you have to um, make sure that you have keywords. That was my experience. It's always about help and support. No? Like I'm also your, your brain, I will help you. Hi, I'm Nisa from um, Royal Hobart Hospital and we've had the Navigator for a couple of years now, I'd say, which has been working um, really well. Um, how do you report back at the end of each shift or week on what your barriers have been? Uh, we, we devised a, a report for the manager, and it doesn't have to be a lengthy report, so it's what went well on the shift is the first thing we do, and then what was the, the, the barriers and what were the problems, so we can mount all the problems up at the end of the week and then say to the administrators, these are the issues you still haven't sorted out in the ward areas. So we quite like that, and the navigators are keen to do such a thing, but most of it ends up being quite positive how the nurses were responding to the workload, etc. Furloin? <laughs> Just one last sentence to this as well. If we already um, identify huge impediments during the day, we already escalate it to the NAM or to the staff specialist. Thank you. I get, yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I also wondered, Martin, uh, I guess the key to this might be that the clinical credibility of that nurse really might be a, a component of that that actually has yeah. buy-in is what I'm gathering. Is that Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, you know, nurses have to see value in it. Medical staff have to see value in it. And if you're an imposter, then, of course, it's, it may not uh, result in buy-in or engagement. Yeah. Well, we actually brag about them being a CNS2 position and they have to be appointed into the position and we get the people to do it for a length of time. Obviously, it gets too much for some people. So after three months, we rotate people around, but we don't have a different one every day. So if Furloin's on, she'll do it for, you know, a couple of months on, the, on regular shifts, etc. So we, we keep it steady so the people get used to who the person is. And uh, as we say, they wear scrubs, so they're looked at as clinical and they've got huge navigator stickers on the side so if they're leaning on the wall you can still see who they are. I also wondered in uh, in a big department like North Shore you, you know where you've got you know 60 patients that are in the ED yeah, at one yeah. point possibly in beds and all that sort of stuff there may be overwhelming there might be too much work for that navigator role have you encountered that and talk us through how you might um, no, get through that? No because quite a well our, the real estate of the beds is quite tight where we are, so we're very strict in our models of care. So in the waiting room, we've adapted the SIN nurse and the triage nurses, and we've got an IV nurse. So we separate the waiting room chaos from the actual bed, so the navigator stays in there. The other thing, they, they slip into paediatrics. Paediatrics becomes quite a problem, you see, as well, and then mental health. So we try and stay away from the mental health because that's, there's never any beds there. So basically, the navigator stays in the main arenas and in paediatrics, and we don't go near the waiting room. Otherwise, it's too much for one person. Well, everyone, join me and thank uh, Martin and Nicole very much for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.